through this with Shane, this study in Revelation. Um, I have uh, had several weeks to go through the seals, the bowls, and the trumpets. This, this, um, this study is, is that there are several sections of this book that are broken down for us. Now, um, I, uh, over the last couple weeks, I have been trying to use some new technology here. So um, I'm only using a little bit each time until I become more and more uh, accustomed to it. But um, I don't want it to be distracting. But what we have found is, is that this idea of the, the book of Revelation is, is divided into three different sections. You have, you have um, chapters 1 through 5 that deal with kind of an intro to the book, right? And then you have verses 17, or chapters 17 through 22, that kind of form a conclusion to this book. We'll spend more time dealing with, the, with this area and this area, because those are pretty simple more simple than these bowls, these trumpets, and these, these seals. But what we find is, is that probably the meat of this book is, is kind of set, set into the, the core section, these chapters 6 through 16, okay? Well, we don't get much teaching on those things. A, we don't understand it. And I stand here in the midst of us all saying there's a lot in chapter 6 through 16 that I cannot grasp. Maybe it's cryptic. And we just we don't put much effort to look at John 3.16 and said, For God so loved the world. Hey, love, God, world, that's me. That he gave his only son. When we start talking about four horsemen and flying beasts and the great prostitute and this number called 666, we start, mm, let's move on. God loves me. That's enough. I, I jest about that. But there is some seriousness to that. Even in the things that we cannot understand, Never, never, never let it affect your trust in God. You know, in seminary and, and in college and, and in the uh, scholarly and scientific world, there is this debate and this struggle on evolution and creation. Some people go to the mat for that. Some people, their whole Christian theology, again, theology is just what we think about God or what we believe about God. Their whole theology is tied up in that. Well, my friends, it's not about that. It's about God. It's about God's love. It's about God's faithfulness. And so in the midst of this book, what we see is, what we start to see in this book, that if we start in chapter 1 and we go to chapter 22, what we start seeing is this progressive revelation or this progressive increased intensity to the culmination of the new heaven and the new earth. And then chapter 1 and chapter 2 and 3, we start seeing the struggles that are going on in the, in the churches. The seven churches that are outside of the, the, uh, um, uh, the uh, that are outside in the providences and whether we're historical, preterist, futurist, or idealist, these, these churches become um, examples of of how people have turned to apostasy or people have, have struggled with the things that are going on in the world around them. And then specifically in first century AD, the trouble was what? Emperor worship. 
It is this struggle that if I don't worship the emperor, I will be, I will be, you fill in the blank. I will be punished. I will be killed. I will be ridiculed. I will be dot, dot, dot. And this becomes the foundation that upon which the rest of the book um, starts to flow. It becomes the reason. It becomes the why to the book. And in the 21st century, as we look at this book, we can start saying, hey, I may not be in this type of scenario, but if God is faithful in those areas, will he not be faithful in my area too? And this is the, the, the beautiful thing of Scripture. You start seeing this Hebrew word all the way through, which is hesed, all the way through the Old Testament. And that is translated God or steadfast faithfulness everywhere. And it is only attributed to God. No man, no woman, no boy, no child, and outside of the living realms, no possession can give you chesed. Chesed is only from God. And the reminder for the churches in first century and for us today is that God is faithful. And what you see happening in the very next chapters, what we went over for the last couple weeks, and we specifically spent a week on each chapter because this becomes the, the foundation upon which the whole book begins to turn that the troubles that the people in the churches are facing are in, not, are in no comparison to the glory of God. Everything that we think is, is imminent and pressing and um, um, such a detriment, they pale when John is able to describe what is happening in the throne room. There's something about perspective that gives us the more perspective, the further away, whether it's the proximity of space, whether it's the distance of time, or whether it's the internal being able to separate yourself and look at the event from a third point of view. There is something about seeing everything that God can, will, and is doing that gives us a hope. Not on our abilities, but on the abilities that, that flow from God being faithful. So, term one. <coughs> We've been there. And this doesn't make light of the turmoil that we go through. The anxiety, the fears. I'm not saying that, that to make light of those. <coughs> But what John is doing here, and the way, with the, as the revelation progresses, we start seeing these, um, this, this, the judgment of God built upon this foundation, or this pivot point, or this crux, that God is sovereign. If that didn't show up, if there was no th throne room scene in... Um, Revelation. Nobody would be able to get another perspective. Nobody would see the bigger picture. Nobody would be realizing that the sovereignty of God will not be thwarted. The sovereignty and will of God will transcend, will, will uh, penetrate every single thing that comes in this world. And that does not mean that everything turns out the way we would like. But we can rest assured that God has not abandoned us. That God has not left us orphaned. So, from the perspective of the throne room, we start seeing all of the things that are going on in this, um, what will happen. Now, the preterist view, remember, is the view that 
It is in the future of the first century church. These things. With Babylon being the emperor or the Roman Empire, that the preterist view is this idea that what John is speaking about is in the future, but it is in our past. And it's going to happen in most of those readers' lifetime. The historicist says, no, it goes beyond there and speaks about the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages and the Medieval period, which is still in our past. The futurist view says that things that happen in these, these scenarios are, are going to happen in, even in our future. Okay, The idealist says it's not going to happen. It's just a picture of who God is. It's an example of, of God's sovereignty, of what God is capable and willing to do. Now, Shane uh, and, and I, on, on a lesser extent, uh, tend to push this preterist view. Okay, and um, so what we will see here in these chapters of 16 and um, uh, through uh, 6 through 16, we are going to see a difference of, of three um, artifacts or three uh, instruments that are to uh, unleash the judgment of God. And they start out with the seals. And remember the one who was on the throne. He was the only one who was able and capable and to open and break the seals. Which tell us something beautiful about God being in control. Doesn't it? <coughs> Things don't happen without God being in control. You can go back to, uh, to the book of Job and you can have Job sitting right here in the center. And you have around Job is God. And if you want to call evil or sin or things of anxiety, anything that comes to Job must go through God. And that is what Job chapters 1 through 2 state. When Satan came, God said, you can do this, but don't do this. You can do this, but don't do this. That may not give us warm fuzzies, but it does give us the idea that God is in control. And so when we start with the seals that are going to be broken, we know that it is the hand of the Son of God who is capable of opening these seals. Someone tell me, is it the trumpets or the bulls next? I think it's the trumpets, right? Trumpets. Yeah, okay. Then the trumpets happen. And then you have the bowls or the vials. What we see is in all of these, they are divided into seven parts. And these seven parts consist of, of three, two sections. The first three, one through three, or I'm sorry, it's the first four, they deal with things that are on the earth. Then you have these the five and six that is more cosmic. Sometimes seven is included in that, but in, in the first two, seven seems to be, like in the seals, seven seems to be the seal that uh, opens the next uh, judgment, wrath of judgment, opens the next uh, judgment. So one through three or four are cut on the earth. Things that are happening in nature, things that are happening in weather, things that are happening around us. Five and six seem to be pointing, and sometimes seven seem to be pointing to the cosmic areas. And seven seems to be opening up the next. So the seventh seal opens up and there's seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet opens up and there is seven bowls. Numbers are very important in Scripture. And uh, seven has been uh, given this idea of completion, of perfection. Um, you know, this is just an interpretation. Nowhere in Scripture does it say it. Uh, when Jesus says, uh, how many times, when Jesus was asked, how many times should I forgive my brother? He says, 
he, he, you know, the, the, the law said seven times the idea of completeness. I'm done. Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. Just keep on going. Seven days, seventh day after crea of creation, resting. And so sometimes evil is associated with six. Because it is not quite perfection. It's one off. It just can't quite get to there. So the number six sometimes in this numerology has, has been, been attributed to um, the, the evil and, and the uh, inability to, to be perfect. These are not meant to uh, be a broad interpretation. Okay? In the context, they have to be interpreted in different ways. So I don't want you to say uh, that there's, when you read seven or six, that that is the interpretation that you think is happening or what we have to look at these different things in their um, uh, uh, context so what we see happening here are seals trumpets and vials that become the venue of God's judgment and John is in advance he is seeing he is witnessing this end of terror that ushers in what we want to say as the new heaven, the new earth, the kingdom of God, the, the not yet. You know, when we speak of the kingdom of God, sometimes we say it's here and not yet. Have you ever heard that? The kingdom of God is here. But it is also there's a sense that the kingdom of God is yet to be. How is the kingdom of God here? The kingdom of God is here through the church. We become the kingdom of God to the people out there. Now, we don't kind of set up barriers. It's us and them. We become a, a, a vessel, the hands and feet of God's kingdom out there. When we take communion, what do we do? We say that this is the body of Christ that is broken for you. And our hope is, is that we realize that as we ingest that, not only physically, but we ingest that spiritually. And this is, an, a, a, this is a visual reminder as we carry that body of Christ, where? To the world. And we become this kingdom of God, this representation of God's kingdom. Although we are broken, we are the broken body of Christ being for the world the kingdom of God. That's the here. The not yet is the new heaven and the new earth. And as John witnesses the things that must unfold, that are going to take place, they all take place as a predicate or as a catalyst that brings in or ushers in the um, kingdom of God. So what I want to do here is kind of show you a few um, uh, examples of, of, of how this is interpreted in different ways. And um, so as I, let's see here, let's go to this one. There we go. So as I look at these here, I'm going to bring these up. This first one here kind of is what we call the, uh, a, a uh, um, they say it's kind of, a, it's recapitulation. Um, but what, what they're saying is, is that these vents, the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls, are not necessarily uh, three different events, but the same events that are just told in three different ways. Okay, I'm just kind of giving you kind of an overview of how these uh, are, are viewed in different ways. So here you have the uh, seals, then you have the trumpets, then you have the bowls, and all of these right here are the same things just told in three different ways. Uh, one of the other things that happens in these is the idea that that there are these interludes that happen in between each one 
in seven one through eight, you have this these uh, the uh, the great multitude of 144,000. Then you have this peculiar thing of eating the scroll and the two the two witnesses. Um, so you start seeing these interludes, and and when Shane picks up in two weeks, he will start with these interludes, and he will kind of go into a little bit of a talk or a discussion about those things. So that's the recapitulation. There's another way to look at this: is that that these are consecutive. These become events that uh, first there is the seals. The seventh opens up the trumpets. The trumpets happen. The seventh trumpet opens up the bowls. And you start seeing this progression of time that, that first the seals happen, then the trumpets happen, and then the bowls happen. And that's, one, that's another way of, of folks who are looking at it, who might interpret it. The other one is more, or this one kind of explains that same one. The other one here is uh, an idea that these seals there is a sense of, of increased intensity as these uh, increase. They are, as these unfold, they are consecutive, but there is this progressive increase of intensity as they get. And you cannot deny, as you read these, that the intensity grows as this is unfolding between uh, unfolding before John's eyes. So you have these three views, and whether it's a recapitulation, whether there is this idea of, 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 of uh, consecutive, or whether this is a, an example of the intensifying, um, it really does not do us any hill of beans to spend too much time talking about that. What we do notice here is, is that through this all, through the seals, through the trumpets, through the vials or the bowls, what we start seeing is the demolish of the kingdom of Babylon. The kingdom of Babylon that, that sets itself up in opposition to God's, uh, to God's kingdom. And, and these two things, as they... As God's kingdom and as the kingdom of Babylon uh, stand up toe to toe, this is the, uh, the judgment or what will happen to this, this kingdom of Babylon. This kingdom that stands in opposition to God's kingdom. That's what we come face to face here. God's kingdom and the kingdom of Babylon. And as these hold their, their lines, what we see is that God's kingdom here will prevail over the kingdom of Babylon. Now, what would be a personal um, benefit to you and I of something as revelation when it comes to the uh, seals, the trumpets, the bowls? It is not us wishing our enemies the seals, the trumpets, the bulls. Although that might be how we're wired. <laughs> I love what uh, Romans says. Paul says, live at peace with each other at the end of chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, he says, live at peace with one another. Do your best to be loving and kind. <clears throat> because when you are nice, it's like uh, a heaping bowl or a heaping pot of hot coals that you're dumping on their head. <laughs> that's what Romans, that's what Paul told the church in Rome. <clears throat> and, and throughout what we see here in, in these, these seals and these trumpets and bowls, is not necessarily focused on these, but what is focused is on this kingdom of God and the belief and the realize that God's kingdom will prevail. Over and over and over again throughout Scripture, 
whether you are Moses, well, let's start, whether you are the Egyptians in captivity for 400 and some odd years, whether you are Moses, who has been called to lead them out, whether you are David, who is facing Goliath, whether you are Josiah, who was an eight-year-old king who turned around a kingdom for God, whether you are Hezekiah that started the Passover feast again, wherever you find yourself in Scripture, you will see that the, the God that we worship is a God who prevails. That there is nothing that is capable of standing in His way. God will prevail. And when these in the church of first century that John addresses thinks their world has come to an end, they come to this, this glorious realization after reading John's revelation after being built upon that throne room, that God is sovereign. I do want to make sure that we don't miss something so very important, that it doesn't always mean that our way will happen. Or it will be done in our timetable. Because there is this sense of trust that we, we relinquish. And we say, God, you are bigger. And I will trust this idea of chesed. This steadfast faithfulness. So, in our Babylons, we might be faced with a lot of Nero's that are demanding our attention. Let me say, I remind you that I stand there in the midst of you and experience that also. What we do with that is so very important. Do we trust ourselves? Do we try to fix it ourselves? Do we try to take control for ourselves? Do we try to make it happen? Do we try to make it happen in our way or our timetable? Do these become the things that we try to do? All that does is make the, the greater intensity of anxiety. What I suggest is as we give it to God, we ask God to, we, we, when we give it to God and we're, we trust this God who is faithful, these anxieties subside because we can see that bigger picture. So, this is in a nutshell the seals, the trumpets, the bulls. I, I wanted to go into detail about the horsemen, the martyrs underneath the altars, the things of the events, but you know what? Let's get to the big picture, okay? Uh, any questions or comments that um, you might have about this before we bring this to a close? John, can I do, yeah. can do another study at some time that does, at a smaller scale in a longer time period, because I know you're limited on time, go into the horses mm -hmm. and the people in the mm -hmm. military, that's what Absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, No, no, it's just we, we had a little bit more um, uh, time, I think, 
in our last one that I was able to go into a little bit more detail, the white horse, the black horse, the red horse, the four corners, all this kind of thing. Um, and all it is is speculation. I mean, 90% of it is a speculative. Because what John is doing is, um, let's say you are a futurist. Just really quick, let me just, let's say you are a futurist. You believe that the things from 6 to 17 or 6 to 16 are all about things that are going to happen in our future. Okay? Let's say that's the case. Let's say you're John and you see something that is very common to us. What is that? TV. Yeah, wow, I did pretty good. <laughs> that's a TV. Okay? You like that? It's an old one. Funny ears and everything. Now, what if inside that that uh, um, that TV it was broadcasting an ocean wave? Okay. All right. So now you're John, and you are looking into the future, and you're seeing this happen. Describe that for me. And there before me stood a box that had antlers like the gazelle. And inside the box there was rushing waters that stood mountains high, and the winds were blowing. Now, we would look at that and we say, John, that's a TV. But John did not have that in his context. So the things, the ideas, let's say there's a let's say he saw a helicopter. How would he describe a helicopter? And there came out of the sky flying locusts that stung with fire. Well, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, so it's, it's, um, it's fun to look at, but you know, very, very difficult to, uh, to do. But yeah, we'll, we'll look into that and do uh, that. Um, and any, uh, any other uh, questions about this area right here? Russell, do you have one? I don't have a question, but I got a comment. Comment it's, away. It's, it's, a it's a first century man trying to describe 21st century technology in his, in his uh, language. Yeah, well, who knows if John would be able to, and who knows if we would be able to recognize it. So um, we are hitting the 1040 hour. And um, church is, beyond, is, is before us, and uh, so let us uh, close in a word of prayer, and um, we will uh, dismiss. Gracious Heavenly Father, may you be glorified that whether or not we, um, no matter where we find ourselves, may there be this sense within us all that you are in control. To you be honor and glory. Amen.